Hi, welcome to the course of Understanding Microservices Architecture. I'm really excited that you chose it. I hope you find the course content relevant to your needs and it helps in your professional career ahead. If at any point of time you have any specific questions, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Microservices Architecture is one of the most widely adopted technologies today. It helped in transforming many businesses around Netflix, PayPal, Twitter, Uber, Spotify, Etsy, Amazon are just few of the companies. Some of the early adopters like Netflix have helped in shaping up the architecture significantly. In traditional mode, software systems are developed by keeping multiple modules together as one unit. But as the requirements for the businesses grow, more number of modules need to be added into the system or the existing modules can start getting bigger. Beyond a point, it becomes difficult to maintain such systems. We cannot fix the issues on time. We cannot extend them with new feature sets, etc. Such big systems are also termed as monoliths. Microservices architecture provide an alternative approach to build the large software systems. The approach is simple. Break the system into smaller pieces. We can call them services or more specifically microservices and bring them together to realize the expected software behavior. The new architectural style provides multiple benefits, but the implementation of this style demands new patterns, frameworks, and technologies. The topic is really wide and covers multiple aspects of software development. In this course, we will understand each of the key areas of the microservices architecture. We will start with the overview section. In this, we will look at the definition of microservices architecture, along with its characteristics and benefits. The next section will focus on modeling services where we will understand the core principle to define or design microservices. In managing data section, we will understand how to deal with data storage, data transactions, and reporting needs. After this, we will move to one of the most critical aspects of the architecture, integrating microservices. In this, we will understand the service interactions and patterns like circuit breaker, API gateway, service mesh, etc. The next section deals with deploying the microservices. We will understand the CI CD aspects along with host options and container technologies like Docker and Kubernetes. Post this, we will move to the section of testing microservices. We will look into the test pyramid, post production, and non functional testing strategies. Monitoring microservices is the section where we will cover service and system monitoring along with metrics, alerts, and log management. We will conclude the course in the last section where we will also understand the limitations and challenges of this architecture. So who can take the course? Well, the course is focused towards the design concepts. So the direct beneficiaries are of course, architects, developers, DevOps, and the testing professionals. But the people in other roles like Scrum Master, Manager, support professionals will also benefit from it. In fact, so anybody who is interested and has a background in software development is welcome to join. About me, my name is Lal Verma. I'm a software architect. I have around 20 years of experience in developing enterprise grade softwares. My expertise includes microservices, cloud computing, serverless computing, big data, middleware, NoSQL, and many other legacy technologies and frameworks. If you're interested in connecting to me, you can find me on Medium or LinkedIn. In this very first section, we are going to discuss the definition, characteristics, and benefits of the microservices architecture. We will also discuss the supporting technologies which played a crucial role in the evolution of it. Microservices architecture provides solutions to the problems of monolith systems. So it makes sense to start the discussion with this topic. In a monolith implementation, 
enterprise applications are typically built in three parts user interface backend system and a database in legacy applications even the user interface used to be bundled together with the backend services let's not consider that case and assume a better version of monolith where user interface is sitting separately all the calls from user interface go to the backend system where multiple modules sit together as a single unit these modules communicate to the database to read or write the application data and returns the response back to the user interface when we are talking monolith in the context of microservices we are talking about the backend services where multiple modules are sitting together as one unit let's say we have an e-commerce system which is based on the monolith architecture if it's modularized well we can think of multiple modules in the system user management product management shopping cart etc in case of monolith systems all these modules are bundled together as one application this means we either deploy all the modules together or none if i need to make change in one module user management let's say i need to validate all the other modules to check if each of them is functioning fine or not as the modules are tightly coupled there is a good chance that change at one module can impact other modules once the validation on all the modules is done i will be building and deploying the whole system again this created longer change cycles any new feature needs to go through this long validation cycle to come into effect another challenge comes with multiple modules sharing code with each other this restricts the overall maintainability this works fine when the systems are small but when they become large it becomes difficult to work on one particular module in isolation as already discussed there is always a risk of impacting other modules another challenge which monolith face is the ability to scale themselves if we are facing problems in one module we are forced to scale the whole application which is much costlier with these challenges enterprises started looking solutions around it and they landed up with a new architecture style the microservices architecture though the software community started talking about microservices as back as 2011 and 12 a consistent definition was not available for long Netflix referred to it as fine grained soa and other enterprises something else but the most accepted definition is provided by Martin Fowler and James Lewis Martin Fowler is one of the most renowned thought leader when it comes to software development and James Lewis is the principal consultant at Thoughtworks according to them the microservice architecture is the one that follows following characteristics Componentization via services, organized around business capabilities, products, not projects, smart endpoints and dump pipes, decentralized governance, infrastructure automation, design for failure, and evolutionary design. Let's take a closer look at these characteristics. As we discussed earlier, our monolith system can have multiple modules stitched together. For instance, in e-commerce system, modules could be the user management, shopping cart, order management, etc. An equivalent microservices architecture should componentize each of these modules as services which can be independently deployed. Componentization in the form of libraries will not work here. So in our e-commerce system, we should develop each of the component, order management, user management, shopping cart, etc. as independent services the components should be organized around business capabilities it does not support modularizing the system based on technical functions like user interface back end service database admins or the middleware team instead the services should be componentized around business functions like user management shopping cart order management etc as we discussed earlier so we did not modularize around the technical boundaries but what about the processes 
Typical software life cycle includes requirement analysis, design, development, testing, deployment, and support, which require multiple teams in traditional implementations. Microservices architecture suggests that all these functions should be carried out by one team. If there are n microservices, we should have n teams. Each of the microservice teams should take care of the complete life cycle of the service, including design, development, test, deployment, and support. We should implement the philosophy of smart endpoints and dump pipes. Endpoints are services which should carry all the logic and not any middlewares, such as ESP, the Enterprise Service Bus. This characteristic specially refers to the service-oriented architecture, where ESP provided multiple functions such as orchestration, business rules, along with routing and transformation. Microservices architecture advocates against the usage of any heavy middleware. It supports lightweight messaging though, where we can only focus on the message routing and nothing else. Traditional architectures revolved around centralized governance. A central team standardized the technologies, tools, deployment strategies, and other development policies. Microservices architecture goes against the centralized governance as it restricts the independent development of the services. The governance aspects cannot be absolute zero, but should be minimized as much as possible. Our build pipelines should be automated. This includes automated tests and automated deployments. We should enable these automations in the pipeline to speed up our deployments. The architecture should be designed to handle the failures. Both the service and the infrastructure failures should be handled properly. Many design patterns help in implementing service failures, including circuit breaker, retry, and timeouts. The services and infrastructure should be continuously monitored for current or future failures. We should have the capability to automatically fix the issues through rollbacks, auto-scaling, etc. The architecture should support the evolutionary design of the system. We should be able to add new services when needed. We should be able to remove the services which are not in use. We should be able to split the service if needed. For instance, in our case, we should be able to replace the user management with user profile and user login services. The replaceability of services helps the system to evolve freely and make the component changes independently. The definition provided by Martin Fowler and James Lewis gave an elaborated view on microservices architecture. Though all the implementations cannot follow all these characteristics, they are expected to follow most of them. So what are the benefits? There is not one or two, there are many, and we will be discussing each one of them. Technology independence. This is the very first advantage. We can choose the independent technologies for each of our services. Let's say one of the services product management is developed in Java. This does not stop us from choosing another technology for another service. For instance, we can build a shopping cart service in Node.js. We can choose MongoDB to be the storage for product management, whereas Redis can be the database for shopping cart. Microservices architecture gives the freedom to the individual teams to choose the best suitable technology for their services. Ease of testing is another benefit. As each of the microservices are developed separately, they are independently testable. Even though these services communicate with each other, they are only loosely coupled. If the services are updated with the new features, they can be validated without worrying about other microservices. Ease of deployment is one of the key advantages. With microservices architecture, each of the services can have different runtime environments. For instance, the product management service could be based on the Java runtime, whereas the shopping cart service could be based on the Node.js runtime. 
the architecture provides the flexibility to each of the microservices to be deployed or updated in its own environment with its own timelines even the complexity of deployment reduces significantly as the size of the service is much smaller than the monolith with independent deployment we can make the best decisions for each of the service scalability needs for instance if we see a high traffic during holiday seasons we can increase the number of instances for shopping cart service or let's say our recommendation service is running heavy processes and it needs to double its memory we can scale the service vertically to meet the needs scaling services independently increase the overall scalability of the system at much lower cost in monolith even if a single module is not working right this can bring down the whole system in general this is not the case with microservices let's say our retention management service is down and not available this will not impact the functioning of other microservices users will not be able to make the returns request but they can very well do the other functions searching a product adding a product creating the order etc this increases the overall availability of our system so we have the inventory management service that serves a critical function for our e-commerce system but as we moved this into a separate service even the other systems can consume it be it the warehouse management our store point of sales or even the accounting service any service which needs to exchange any information on inventory can do so by communicating with the inventory management service had it been bundled inside the e-commerce system we couldn't have achieved this level of reusability improved maintainability again taking the example of shopping cart service let's assume it's based on java 8 as the service is small it will be much easier to upgrade it to the later java versions if we are using spring mvc we can easily extend to use more compatible platform like spring boot you can change the database if it's not the right fit for you in fact you can change the whole platform and switch to the node js some experts believe that the scope of microservices should be defined in such a way that it can be completely rewritten in just few weeks if needed all these factors along with the ease of testing and ease of deployment makes the overall maintainability of the service very high modeling microservices in this section we will understand how to model the microservices this helps in defining the boundaries and scope for the services this is one of the most critical step in the microservices architecture and must be done right before moving to specific implementations i am going to discuss three important principles we must keep in mind to get this right single responsibility high cohesion and loose coupling they provide the building block for microservices architecture let's take a closer look at each of them the title itself is self explanatory each microservice should serve a single responsibility only this is one of the most important design principles we practice this principle with object oriented programming to define the scope of class module etc we have to extend this concept for the microservices now it helps in defining the bonding context of the service moving away from this principle can lead to another monolith system let's consider the example of an e-commerce system where we identified a microservice which is serving two functions product catalog and shopping cart we took the decision because both the functions need to be developed in the same technology 
and the organization thought to keep it under one manager. If we look into these functions, they are completely independent. If we club them together, gradually they will start sharing a lot of code and become intertangled. They'll start facing challenges, difficult to maintain, difficult to test, difficult to deploy, etc. We must separate out the services so that each of them can focus on its responsibility and evolve independently. Mixed responsibilities in microservice will suffer the same challenges as any other monolith. High cohesion. High cohesion principle says that all the related behavior should sit together. Let's assume we have two services, order management and order total calculator service. One has a responsibility to do order management, whereas the other takes care of calculating the order total amount. Let's say the get order details API exposes the order data in response, which contain tax and service charges. The calculator API calculates the total based on the item, unit prices, taxes, and service charges. Life is wonderful, but the government added a new tax called the education surcharges. Now in the order service, I need to return the additional attribute. At the same time, we need to update the calculator service. Every time there is a change in attributes in the order service, there is a possibility that the calculator service will also get updated. This is the tight coupling and must be avoided. As the calculation logic is related to the order, it should be merged with the order management service only. This way we will achieve high cohesion as the related behavior is sitting together. The principle of loose coupling ensures that the change in one service does not impact other services. Not following single responsibility and high cohesion can lead to the tight coupling. But there are many other factors too. Here we will discuss the practices which help in ensuring the loose coupling across the services. This include hide implementation details, avoid shared libraries, avoid overexposure, and avoid sharing databases. Let's discuss each one of them. Hide implementation details. We will continue with the example we discussed in high cohesion. Now our order service has an API to calculate the total amount. But why should we expose it? Isn't this the internal implementation? If other APIs or user interface get hold of this API, they can misuse it or create unnecessary coupling. Instead of exposing this API, we should just calculate the total amount and update in the order object while creating the order itself. This order object can be returned through get order details API as it was already happening. Avoid shared libraries. As per some experts, shared libraries make a distributed monolith, which is more problematic than the original one. Let's say one of the teams has generated the Java library to validate the user token. Many services found it useful and started consuming it, including our order service. As the library is built on Java 8, a order service platform is also coupled to the Java 8 indirectly. Let's say our order service wants to use the latest Java version, Java 16, but the library is not compatible. This restricts the upgrade. Here the dependency has been created with a specific Java version, but there could be many other reasons where the service can get tightly coupled to the shared library. In general, we should minimize organization-specific shared libraries in the microservices architecture. One of the better options to reuse the library is to fork it at the code repository level so that you can customize it 
as per your service needs. Avoid overexposure. We should avoid exposing the information which is not needed. For instance, we have the user service which exposes the API to get user details. This API returns the user object which contains many attributes. When the shopping cart service is getting the user details, the overexposed implementation can share all the attributes including the payment information. Though the service does not need it, the API should just return the most common user attributes. Specific attributes should be exposed through another API. Overexposure of attributes can lead to unnecessary dependency and coupling across the services. Avoid sharing database. Though I have written avoid, this should be a strict no. One bounding context should always interact with another bounding context through the interface only. So if our shopping cart service needs product details, it should get the information through the API. It should not connect to the database directly to get this. Exposing the database directly is equivalent to exposing the implementation details. This will eventually create tight coupling with the consuming services. In this section, we will understand how to manage data, transactions, and reporting needs. Let's see how data is managed in a typical monolith system. In monolith, multiple modules sit together and refer to one single database. For instance, if we have our e-commerce system, modules like shopping cart, user service, order management, they will all be connecting to one single database. These databases are typically based on RDBMS, also known as relational databases. Typical technologies include Oracle, MySQL, DB2, etc. Modules can directly connect to the database tables to retrieve or store the data. In monoliths, you will also see a setup where the application databases continuously feed data to the data warehouse which is also used for reporting and analytics. Data warehouses are also based on relational databases, optimized for read operations, along with the BI tools like Tableau, Power BI, etc. Data in microservices is managed differently. We already discussed it while going through the principle of loose coupling. To achieve loose coupling, microservices should follow one service, one database model. This means each of our services, for instance, the user service, shopping cart service, order service, etc., will have their own databases. We can have user service manage the user data, shopping cart service manage the cart data, and so on. And the data can be exposed through the service APIs. Each of the microservices can choose which database technology to use depending upon its business needs, be it the document-oriented, column-oriented, key-value, graph, or the relational database itself. There are a number of options available in the market. MongoDB, Cassandra, Redis, Neo4j are some of the popular NoSQL databases. So now we know how the services can manage the data specific to the services independently. For instance, our shopping cart service can manage the cart data and order service can manage the order data. But what about the product data, which is shared across both the services? Both shopping cart service and the order service need this data. Can they have one database and share this together? No. We must expose this data through another service. Let's call it the product catalog. Shopping cart service and order service should consume the required data through the product catalog API only. Sharing data creates tight coupling and must be avoided. But is this approach applicable everywhere? Let's see another case. Both warehouse management 
service and the shipping service needs a reference of cities. Warehouse management needs it to check its inventory at the city level, whereas shipping service needs it for the shipping purposes. List of cities data is static in nature, which does not change frequently. It does not make sense to expose it through a service. This will be an overhead. At the same time, we cannot have a single database which is shared across multiple services, as this might cause the coupling. A better option is to have separate copies of the city data for each of the microservices. Services can manage each of these copies independently. If a new city is added, which will be in a while, both the services can update this independently. Let's see how we handle the related data. Our shopping cart is keeping a reference of product IDs as part of the cart items. The business needs product title and description on the cart view. In the monoliths, we could have easily gotten the related data in one query and returned it for the cart view. In microservices, this data is managed separately. Shopping cart manages the cart data, whereas the product catalog manages the product data. We can have two approaches to resolve this. One is to get the title and description from the product catalog for each of the items. If the number of items in the cart are more, this can be a performance intensive approach. Another approach is to duplicate the data. As soon as we are adding the item in the cart, we can get the product title, description, and save it as part of the cart item. Challenge with this approach is the data consistency. If product metadata is changed, the data sitting in the shopping cart can become stale. Depending upon the performance, consistency, and business needs, we can choose either of these options accordingly. It's easy to carry out the transactions in the monolith systems. Let's take an example of a create order transaction, which requires order entry and shipping entry. In this case, if both the records, shipping and order are created, transaction will be successful. This will result in data commit in the database. If either of these records fail, the transaction fails and none of the records are registered in the database. This mechanism is difficult to achieve in the microservices world. This is because both these services will have their own databases and the transaction boundary cannot cover them for a number of reasons. Instead, we can go for an eventual consistency, which says that even though the data is not consistent now, it will be done eventually. Let's say our order record is created but the shipping record is failed. To handle such scenarios, we can introduce a queue mechanism which can sit right in the middle of these two services. A queue mechanism will receive the created shipping request. Shipping service can pull this request from the queue as soon as it is available. If it's able to process the request, the data will become consistent. If not, we can switch to a retry mechanism. In this case, the queue will continue to keep the request which can be retried again and again till the shipping record is created. This will finally ensure that the data is consistent. But there could be an extreme scenario where the maximum number of retries is exhausted and the shipping record is not created. In this case, we can come up with a dashboard where we can display all the orders which are not processed. The operations team can look into these orders and can take actions. It can call the shipping team to coordinate and fix the issue with the shipping service once it's ready. Team can manually trigger the create shipping request, which will be processed and the data will become consistent. Eventual consistency provides a flexible mechanism to carry out the distributed transactions. 
Most of the enterprise use cases can be managed through this approach with no need of transaction management or strong consistency. Many times we cannot optimize our queries. Business can demand the data which requires aggregation and more optimized read operations. For instance, it can ask for daily sales of products, daily sales city-wise, products with insufficient inventory today. These queries typically fall under reporting, which can demand data from multiple services. We must continue our approach to data warehouses as we had in the monolith. Or in the microservices architecture, we can call it a reporting service. The question arises how to sync up the data with each of the microservices. We cannot have a single ETL process as the database is being split now. We can follow multiple approaches in this regard. Let's say we want to push the order data to the reporting database. The first approach being the API calls. As soon as the report is requested, we can query the related data from the microservices. This can be a costly process. Also, the microservices must need to expose the APIs which are more aligned with the reporting needs. Also, the reporting tools typically create the read-optimized views of the data, so they cannot rely on the dynamic queries. Another approach is to create a data pump which can push the data from the microservice to the reporting database. Microservice team can own this data pump code. We can define a batch process to do it. Another option is the data event. As soon as the order is created, we can create an event. Any service registering to this event can receive and process it. Reporting service can subscribe to this event and apply the data pump logic to it. Event-based mechanism is a more favored approach as it provides loose coupling to the data synchronization logic. In this section, integrating microservices, we will understand how to deal with the service interactions. We will understand how we can expose the APIs, how they can interact with each other and the external user interfaces. We will understand multiple interaction patterns, including event-driven architecture, API gateway, circuit breaker, service discovery, and service mesh. Let's begin with the API technologies. In this section, we will check out some popular options to define and expose our API interfaces. The first one being HTTP REST, which is one of the most adopted style when it comes to microservices. The style is easy to understand and best suited for the public management or the resource-driven APIs. One of the best examples could be defining the product catalog service, which has product as a resource and can be managed through CRUD operations like create, update, delete, and read. It supports multiple formats, XML, JSON, HTML, and plain text, though JSON is the most popular choice. One of the primary benefits of this style is its ease of adoption. HTTP had already become the most common platform for the services to interact. So the learning curve is at the least. Other benefits include caching. The caching support at the browser enables a lot of optimization while returning heavy payloads. On the negative side, the style does not do schema validation. So client implementations are more error prone. Also, HTTP protocol adds a lot of additional information in each request, which make them less responsive in terms of latency. RPC is not a new concept. Even so, protocol is an RPC mechanism where we build client and server stubs. 
the client API calls the server APIs as if they are making a local call. SOAP was based on XML, but new RPC based frameworks are full of options. They are more advanced and performant. This is the reason they are used for highly performant APIs. For instance, you have to stream a video content, this could be the best choice. The advanced frameworks like gRPC, Apache Thrift, and others support multiple format options, including protobuf, thrift, flat buffers, JSON. RPC options are easy to use as the client stubs are ready, and making calls and reading the response is like any other local call. On the negative side, they do create tight coupling with the client API implementation. Another popular choice is GraphQL. This was developed by Facebook and is more suited for mobile APIs, where we need data aggregation across multiple services and we cannot afford multiple calls. An example could be where you are looking for product details, product reviews, product recommendations in one single call. This style supports only one format, JSON. It provides the schema definition and validation features which make it a more robust option compared to the rest. It also provides options to define the error messages, more advanced than the HTTP error codes. But it always uses HTTP POST, so we cannot use it for caching and rate limiting. Rate limiting is a concept where we can restrict the number of calls from a specific IP address. We will cover this more while discussing API Gateway. Also, this can cause some serious performance issues if the nested behavior is not taken into account while querying the results. In this section, we will understand what the event-driven architecture is and how does it benefit the microservices architecture. If you have been in software industry from some time, I'm sure you would have heard about synchronous and asynchronous communication. Let's start with a quick recap, as this sets the foundation for our discussion. Synchronous communication is the default pattern when a service calls another service. The other service processes the request and responds back. In this mode, call is blocked till the receiving service is finished processing. For instance, if an order service is calling payment service, it will receive the response once the payment is either completed or failed. On the other hand, in asynchronous communication, the service acknowledges back and processes the request later. For instance, in our case, the payment service will process the payment later, but will acknowledge immediately. Benefit of asynchronous communication is the responsiveness of the service. If payment service is taking a lot of time to process the payment, an end user will also be waiting. In the asynchronous mode, user will get notified immediately based on the acknowledgement. If the payment is paid later on, he or she will be informed separately. Asynchronous communication is common approach to manage time-consuming operations, long-running or background processes. Event-driven architecture is based on asynchronous mode communication. In the event-driven model, the calling service can generate an asynchronous request or the event and it can publish it to the message broker. Message broker, which we sometimes refer as PubSub or the event bus, is a middleware that facilitates the exchange of messages or the events across the distributed applications. The consuming services can subscribe to this event on the message broker. Once the service A publishes the event, the subscribed services will be notified of this message. Each of them can process the message independently. Once done, they can update their database communicate to other services, etc. 
Let's continue our example to illustrate the event driven behavior. In this case, order service will create an event and publish it to the message broker. Order service can immediately return to the end user and inform that the order is created. Let's term this event as payment pending. This event is subscribed by the payment service. So it will consume it and process the payment based on the user's preferred payment mode. This can result in two events, payment completed and payment failed. There are two services which are interested in payment completed event, delivery service and email service. As soon as the email service receive this event, it can send an email to the customer informing his or her order details. On the other side, delivery service can start the delivery process based on this event. In case the payment is failed, the another event will be sent back to the order service, which can put the order on hold. Each of the participating services can be a publisher of an event or a subscriber of another event. This sort of communication provides flexibility to the overall system. Tomorrow, if another service is interested in payment completed event, for instance, the inventory management service, it can directly subscribe to this particular event and the order service does not need to worry about it. So how does this pattern benefit the microservices architecture? It definitely makes the whole system more responsive as the events can be processed asynchronously. This architecture decouples the producer and consumer services. In fact, producer can be completely unaware of the consumer services. As discussed earlier, this provides agility to the system. We can add, remove the consuming services without impacting the producer. This is also termed as choreography, which is opposite to orchestration. In orchestration, everything is controlled through the producer service. In choreography, it's not. This is the reason the flow can be updated with more features easily. On the downside, this adds on the system complexity. Instead of a single call, it becomes a multi-step process. The consumer services make calls to other services to get more details on the event attributes. Another drawback is the inversion of control where producer service is not aware of the consumer services. If the order is failed at some point, it will not be aware of it immediately. We might lose the track of some orders if not monitored properly. Nonetheless, organizations have realized the benefit of this pattern and have adopted it very well. Some of the popular technologies in this area include Apache Kafka, RabbitMQ, Apache Pulsar, Azure Service Bus, Google PubSub. They all provide the highly scalable messaging framework to support the event-driven architecture. Microservices are dynamic in nature. Multiple instances of a single microservice will be coexisting. Each of the instances can have a different IP address or a port. The number of instances can vary as the time progresses. There is no surety that the set of instances active now will be the same after an hour or even a minute. As the instances will keep changing, so are these references, the IP address and the port. This brings up many questions. How to locate a service instance? How to do load balancing? How to get notified if a service instance is added or removed? How to ensure if the service instance is healthy? Service discovery is an architecture pattern which takes care of these challenges. This pattern carry three modules primarily. Service registry, where all the service instances register themselves. Load balancing, which routes the request to an active service instance. Health check, which tracks the health of instances. If an instance is not available, it's not considered for load balancing. 
there are two variations to implement this client side service discovery server side service discovery let's try to understand the concept with the help of an example we have an e-commerce system one of the services is a product catalog service and another is a shopping cart service our shopping cart needs to get the product information from the product catalog service in the client side service discovery pattern service registry which is the core component of the service discovery sits remotely if i have multiple instances of a product catalog service each of them register themselves with this registry which will keep updating the ip addresses and the ports of these instances when the shopping cart service is interested in communicating to the product catalog it calls the service registry first to get the instances information once it has the info it uses the local load balancer to make the call the local load balancer can decide over a particular instance based on multiple algorithms round robin etc and even the health of an instance in case of server side discovery all the modules service registry load balancer and health check are bundled together as one service in the ecosystem similar to the client side pattern each of the instances of product catalog will register itself to the service registry module when the shopping cart service needs to call the product catalog service it will call the load balancer which will redirect the call to an instance in this case the load balancer is sitting on the server side load balancer will choose the instance which is registered in the service registry and is healthy the health of an instance is ensured by the health checker module which keeps the check on the product instances comparing the client side versus server side both the approaches have its pros and cons the most popular choice is the server side though it's because it's easy to manage the load balancing strategies in centralized manner in the latter case here are some popular technologies in this segment netflix was one of the early adopters of microservices architecture it provided the service discovery platform with eureka ribbon and hystrix it was open sourced in 2012 which later merged with spring cloud in 2015 It's little outdated more advanced options are available now Zookeeper was originally developed at Yahoo it provides a distributed coordination service it uses a hierarchical namespace similar to the file system residing in memory it can be used for multiple purposes service registry is one of them etcd is quite similar it is a lightweight distributed key value store that provides a great building block for service discovery similar to zookeeper it can be used for other purposes as well health check is not the focus area for both etcd and zookeeper on the other hand consul provides comprehensive health check options it's an end to end service discovery framework it uses dns to register and discover services which speeds up the remote calls Kubernetes also provide complete solution in this regard. It uses etcd to store service and other configuration data. It uses sky dns as a load balancer and provide inbuilt health check options. If you are using Kubernetes or Consul, service discovery is inbuilt. Consul provides more configuration options to customize it. In the microservices world, services interact with each other through network calls. we must accept the fact that the network or services can fail and this can fail our service interactions we need to handle these failures to ensure our service interactions are more resilient one of the primitive approach to handle it is through retry mechanism but it can often lead to cascading failures which we will discuss in a while circuit breaker provides a matured way to manage such failures as the name suggests This microservices pattern derives its inspiration from the electrical switches. When a particular microservice or resource is not responding, this pattern helps 
in registering the fault, switching off the communication and restoring it back when the service is ready to serve the request. This helps the microservice ecosystem in multiple ways. It handles the service failure and exits gracefully. It helps in reducing the overload on already stressed service. And finally, it stops the cascading failure. Cascading failure happens when the failure of one service propagates to other services. Let's say the service A is not responding to service B requests. To handle the failed request, service B implements the retry mechanism. If the retries from service B continue for long, it can block and exhaust its resources against the unresponsive network calls. This can make even the service B overloaded. If the service C is dependent on service B and it also follows the same mechanism, the failure will start spreading to other services in the ecosystem, from C and D to E and F and so on. This is termed as cascading failure. Circuit breaker pattern helps in controlling the external communications with the help of digital switches. Let's see how it works. The circuit breaker pattern is implemented with three states, closed, open, and half open. The circuit breaker component sits right in the middle of a call and can be used for any external call. Let's try to understand this with an example. In our case, shopping cart service received the request to add an item to the cart. It needs to call the product inventory service to get the product availability. With this pattern in place, the call will go through the circuit breaker component, which will be in a closed state initially. This means the request will pass through normally as if the circuit breaker is not present, but it keeps checking the response for a failure or success. In the case of HTTP responses, we can decide this based on the HTTP response codes. For example, we can treat 2xx as success and 4xs as failures. If it receives the failed response beyond a threshold, the circuit breaker will move to the open state. We can configure this threshold. For instance, I can say that I want to put the threshold of 30%. This means if 3 out of 10 requests are failed, a threshold will be reached. In this open state, the component is not going to forward any request to the inventory service. Instead, it will activate the fallback approach, which could be executing another logic, making another service call, throwing an error, etc. The circuit breaker will maintain its open state for some time. After some time, which we can configure, it will move to the half open state. In this state, it will try to check the health of the inventory service by opening the communication channel. It will forward the limited number of requests to the inventory service in this period. If the rate of failure continues to be above the threshold value, it will move back to the open state again. If not, it will consider it healthy and will move to the closed state. The closed state, which was the initial state of the circuit breaker component, will resume the normal operations. The pattern could be a little difficult to gauge at first sight, but this can play an important part to increase the resilience and reliability of our overall system. Let's look at some popular technologies in this area. One of the earlier frameworks was provided by Netflix Hystrix. Resilience 4J is another option which provides a wider set of patterns to take care of service failures, including rate limiter, retry, bulkhead, etc. Both of these technologies were primarily built for Java. Sentinel is the library provided by Alibaba which supports multiple languages, Go, Java, and C++. Istio, which is a service mesh technology, also provides this as an inbuilt feature. This again is a platform agnostic option. But you cannot use Istio for just the circuit breaker. You must adopt the service mesh framework to use it. A direct client to microservice communication does pose some performance challenges. When the client APIs interact with the services directly, the communication usually becomes chatty. For instance, if it has to render a product view, 
it needs to call product details, product reviews, and recommendation services separately. This can lead to degraded performance, especially for the mobile applications, when network calls are much costlier. Even single-page web application built on Angular or React can face similar challenges. API Gateway provides the solution to this. It creates an abstraction over the microservices. It's similar to the facade pattern in object-oriented programming, which will reside in the system as another microservice. It can cater all the requests, can call the individual services, aggregate the results, and return back to the end user. This process is also referred to as API composition. But that's not all. This pattern opened many other possibilities. We can enable many other non-functional aspects through this. We can use it for authentication and authorization needs. We can call the identity service to check the user identity, its role, and authorize the request accordingly. We do not need to make this call separately in each of the microservices. We can use it for service discovery and do client-side load balancing as we discussed in the client-side service discovery. We can use it to implement circuit breaker while calling the APIs to increase the resiliency. We can restrict the calls to the service if we sense a DDoS attack with the help of rate limiting feature. We will discuss this feature more in the security section. We can use it to modify the request to suit the individual microservices needs for instance, the protocol translation. We can also update the response from microservices for better results. For example, introducing cache headers to enable caching. API management plays a key role when the microservices grow in number. We can use it as an API registry as a reference for the internal and external client APIs. It can be very useful in case of version management where multiple versions of a service are coexisting. We can route to the appropriate versions without any impact to the client API. We can also monitor the performance of APIs from multiple aspects, including the consumption, latency, etc. If any of our services are charged, we can implement the billing APIs at this layer. There are many more cross-cutting concerns which can be implemented at this layer. But hold on there is a catch. Some experts do feel that this pattern, if loaded with so many other functions, can make it a single point of failure. We will see another related pattern to this called backends for frontends while discussing the UI to service interactions. Let's look at some popular technologies in this area. Netflix tool. As usual, Netflix was one of the earliest to offer it. It provides capabilities for dynamic routing, monitoring, resiliency, security, and more. Kong Gateway is one of the popular open source cloud native API gateway built on top of lightweight proxy. It's written in Lua running with the help of Nginx. APG is the most popular when it comes to commercial tools in this area. It started independently, but was taken over by Google later. It provides on-premises as well as cloud options. If your microservices or API is already hosted on AWS, then it makes sense to integrate with Amazon API Gateway. In this section, we are going to discuss the changes in UI interactions with the microservices architecture. Traditional approach can continue in case of microservices as well. Our user interface can consume the microservices APIs directly. For instance, a UI component dealing with the product details can connect to a product catalog service. A product reviews component can connect to the product review service and so on. The first challenge with this option is a limited scope to optimize the API calls. Let's say the mobile interface cannot afford to make so many calls and wants to retrieve the product details, product reviews, and recommendations in the same call. There is no way to achieve this. 
Another challenge is a cross-team dependency. As UI is in place where all the API composition is taking place, a different team would be handling the whole UI implementation. This creates a dependency between the microservices teams and the UI team. If the business needs modification, it needs to communicate to the two teams, UI and the microservices. This can delay the overall implementation. The first challenge can be solved by implementing the backends for frontends pattern. In this, if a user interface wants to optimize the calls, it can create its own backend service to do it. For instance, we can have a mobile backend based on GraphQL, which can help in aggregating the responses with product details, product reviews, and recommendations. The mobile interface only needs to make a single call to get the product view, for instance. As each of the user interfaces can have different needs in this regard, similar backend services can be created for other user interfaces as well. Now, one team which is handling mobile UI can take care of both the UI and backend for the UI. This can give more freedom to the UI team in terms of optimizing the API calls. Unfortunately, this pattern does not help in resolving the second challenge, which deals with the dependency between the microservices and the UI teams. UI fragment composition pattern tries to provide a solution in this regard. We can divide the user interface into multiple fragments and can map them to their respective microservices. And the microservices teams can deliver the corresponding UI fragment for instance, if we talk about the web interface for the product details page, we can divide this in three parts, product details, product reviews, and recommendations. The team handling product catalog service can deliver the product details widget, which can be plugged into the main UI. The main UI could just be a template-based web application, providing the platform to plug various UI widgets. Similarly, other teams like product reviews and recommendations can also provide their own widgets. As the UI fragment and the service both are developed by the same team, they can coordinate well to each other's needs and can speed up end-to-end -end implementations. This option can also work around the first challenge on optimization of the API calls. One of the challenges of this approach is UI consistency which can be managed though with the help of enterprise-wide common CSS, style sheets, icons, etc. But this becomes challenging when it comes to native interfaces like mobiles, variables, etc. Service Mesh is one of the leading frameworks in the microservices world. Let's try to understand it. If one microservice interacts with another, it needs to take care of multiple aspects. We already discussed patterns like service discovery, circuit breaker. Apart from this, we need to implement many other non-functional aspects like security access controls, monitoring, routing, rate limits, tracing, etc. If we implement these concerns along with the service implementation, it creates tight coupling between two different aspects. This makes the service interactions difficult to maintain and standardize. Assume the scenario where we have to implement TLS certificates across all the service-to-service -service communications. If different teams start working on this, it can become a never-ending exercise. Even if they do it, they'll be losing a lot of time which ideally should be put to implement the business features. Also, if each of the teams implement TLS, they will most probably come up with their own implementations which would be non-standard. What if we separate out the handling of these concerns from the service? Can we manage both the implementation separately? If yes, both the maintainability and the non-standardization of service interactions can be easily managed. Service Mesh offers the platform where the non-functional concerns related with service interactions are managed in a more consistent and modular fashion. 
If you remember, even the API gateway tried to do something similar. I mean to implement some of these patterns at the gateway end. Just to clear the doubt, both the patterns have different objectives. API Gateway is more concerned about the public facing use cases, whereas Service Mesh focus on the internal service to service communications. Also, Service Mesh does not provide a single point of failure as it is the case with API Gateway. Let's see the details of how it works. There are multiple service mesh technologies including Linkerd, Istio, Consul, etc. More or less, they work on same architecture based on proxies. We will take the reference to Istio to understand the core components and functions of service mesh here. In this setup, each of the microservices is associated with one proxy each. These proxies are also termed as sidecar proxies. All these proxies reside in data plane. They intercept all the requests coming to and from the service and enable the non-functional concerns we discussed earlier. Let's say microservice A makes an HTTP call to microservice B. The sidecar proxy on the service A can load balance the call intelligently across the instances of service B. It can retry the request if it fails. Similarly, the sidecar proxy on the service B side can reject the call if it's not allowed or it's over the rate limit. Another important component in service mesh is the control plane, which helps in coordinating the behavior of proxies and provides an API to manipulate and measure the mesh. It's responsible for managing the sidecar proxies, ingress, egress gateways, service registry, certificates, and other management aspects. Service Mesh provides a cleaner mechanism to deal with these service interactions. Organizations have started realizing its potential and industry adoption is increasing day by day. In this section, we will understand three important aspects while deploying microservices. Continuous integration and delivery, hosting options, and container technologies, including Docker and Kubernetes. Continuous integration is not a new concept. We need regular code integration and regular stable builds. This ensures the code maintainability and early feedback on it. We can always revert back to the previous version if needed. These principles become more important in case of microservices as we need to release the updates more frequently. The ideal model is that each microservice has its own code repository and own build process. Independent teams can push their changes to respective repos which can trigger the builds and generate the service artifact. So one microservice maps to one repo one build process and one artifact. So if we have order catalog, shopping cart, and order management as three services, we must have three different repos and three different build processes. If either of it is combined together, for example, having a single repository or a single build process, we will lose the flexibility to release the service updates independently. Once our continuous integration is ready, we can work on the continuous delivery. In the microservices world, each commit is a release candidate. We can build an independent pipeline for each of the microservices. The pipeline can have multiple stages where the release candidates are validated. If all the stages are cleared, we can move the build for production deployment. Here is a sample build pipeline we can have unit testing, integration, sanity, performance, and finally, the production deployment as various stages in the pipeline. Each of these stages can be validated in different environments. For instance, integration test will have a separate environment than the staging one, which can be used for UAT. Each of the stages can be automated or manual. For instance, integration testing could be a manual process but performance test 
could be completely automated. The more automation we have in the pipeline, the more it reduces the time to delivery. Building pipelines in the microservices has its own challenges. One of the primary challenges is to automate the deployments at every stage. We need the artifact, environment, and host to make it happen. Let's take a deeper look at the artifacts and its dependencies to understand what we are dealing with here. We can have different services which can be based on Java, Node, Python, etc. Each of these services can have its own artifact types. For instance, the Java builds will generate the jar or war file. Node will generate an NPM package and Python will generate the eggs as a deployment unit. Each of the artifacts need a specific environment to run. For instance, Java artifacts must have a JVM, web server like Tomcat or Jetty. Node packages must have the Node.js environment and the Python X must have HTTP server like Apache or Nginx along with a WSGI server. We must have the right environments to host our artifacts. In some cases, the dedicated machines could be available, but many times not. You need to create these environments dynamically. That's not all. We must configure the environments for security, logging, and other specific configurations. This makes the task much bigger to manage. If it's not automated, we can lose enough time to release our builds. There are a number of options available to host our services. We can deploy the services to the physical machines, virtual machines or the containers. We can deploy them over the cloud, which can provide all these options. So what's the best model to host our services on either of these hosting options? One of the easiest options is multiple services per host. When I say host, it can be a physical machine, virtual machine, or a container. If we are using physical machines to directly deploy the services, the physical machine becomes the host. If we are using virtual machines, the virtual machine becomes the host. And the same principle applies to containers. Coming back to the deployment option of multiple services per host. In this mode, we can deploy multiple services on the same host. It gives the benefit of host management. A single team can take care of maintaining all the infrastructure and cater the deployment request. This can also be a cost-effective solution. This model more or less was already existing with the enterprises. There are some serious challenges with this model though. We cannot monitor all the services independently. If we monitor the CPU usage or memory, it will be difficult to pinpoint which service is causing the outage in CPU and which one is exhausting our memory. In case one of the services is over consuming the CPUs, it can make all the services deployed on the host as unavailable. Another challenge arises due to the merged environments as multiple services will be hosted on the single machine. The specific environments and configurations might raise conflict and make the overall deployment difficult to manage. Last but not the least is the dependency on the infrastructure team. Each of the microservices teams need to communicate to one single team to deploy their services. This can become a bottleneck and services will lose their autonomy. The other option is to deploy the services as you guessed it right, the single service per host model. The benefits and drawbacks, they get completely reversed in this case. Though we lose on the host management side and the cost, this brings up many advantages. Single service per host model best suits the needs of microservices architecture. The services get independent deployment zones. They can be easily monitored and mapped to specific service and its instances. The teams can independently roll out the service updates. 
They can scale these services as per their needs and so on. Teams and services become more independent with this approach. To run even a single microservice other than the local environment, it involves many tasks. We must do the provisioning of host or reusing the existing infrastructure, creating runtime environments, doing the configuration management and deployment of the artifact. It can become a very time consuming activity if done manually. Also, if we have to repeat this across multiple environments, this can significantly slow down our releases. Infrastructure as a code provides a platform to automate these tasks. We can write the code for each of the steps involved in deploying the microservice and plug in this code to our CI CD pipeline. As soon as the artifact is ready for the next stage, this code can initiate the deployment process. There are many off the shelf frameworks available to help in this area. Some of the popular technologies in this segment include Ansible, Chef, Puppet, and Terraform. All these frameworks are open source. Ansible, Puppet, and Chef are more oriented towards configuration management and do little on the provisioning side, whereas Terraform makes the provisioning of hosts much easier to manage. Most of these tools support declarative language and are easy to get along. We did get a glimpse of multiple host options. In this section, we will understand these options more in detail in the context of continuous delivery and automation. If the organization is new to the microservices, physical machines could be the first choice, as this is the oldest and most traditional option available to the enterprises. If we are really following the ideal model of one service per host, we need to have one physical machine for each of the microservices. So if we got four microservices, we need four different physical machines to deploy them. The biggest challenge of this model is its time for provision. Even to provision a single physical machine, it can take multiple days, weeks, or months. If we really need more instances to scale any of our services, we need to wait for a long period of time. This option is not only time consuming, but also costly. Virtual machines speed up the provisioning to a great extent compared to the physical counterparts. One large machine can run a hypervisor and slice it into multiple virtual machines. Each of these virtual machines can have its own operating system like Linux, Windows, Mac OS, etc. and its own resources like CPU, memory and disk. The virtual machines can be created in just a few minutes, which drastically reduces the provisioning time. To make the host ready for microservice deployment, we need to prepare it with runtime environmental, like installing Java, Node, Python, etc. We also need to install other runtime dependencies and packages. This process could become a time consuming process. In some cases could be an hour, especially if it's done for each stage separately. One solution of this is creating an image. The image can store all the information of the VM including the operating system, resources, runtime environment, dependencies, etc. We can just create the machine from this image and get ready with the host. This was a widely accepted mode of deployment in microservices for years. Containers provided a much leaner approach in this area. It can reside within a machine and have its own isolated zone. We can have multiple containers in each virtual or a physical machine. Continuing with our approach of one service per host, we can deploy one microservice per container. With the help of containers, we can deploy multiple services on the same machines without creating conflicts on the environment or configuration aspects. Containers can create independent zones that are not visible to each other directly. And this helps in avoiding the environment conflicts. The containers share the operating system and this makes creating containers much faster 
than creating a virtual machine. Containers primarily contain the runtime environment which serves specific dependencies and configuration. This makes the container images much lighter to manage and transfer across different stages of CI-CD. This provides a consistent runtime environment for a specific build across multiple environments. The lighter and faster container approach makes the container's delivery more performant and efficient. That makes containers the first choice for microservices deployment as compared to virtual machines. The cloud provides an on-demand platform where we can create and manage the infrastructure dynamically to run our applications and services. It primarily offers options in three areas. IAS, which is also termed as infrastructure as a service, enables the organizations to create and manage the virtual machines and in some cases dedicated machines as well. The organizations can choose among various operating systems, CPU, memory, and region options. This gives the organizations maximum flexibility and control. They are responsible to create the specific runtime environments though. In PaaS, which is also known as platform as a service, even the runtime is provided by the cloud provider. Some of the real-time examples include AWS Lambda, Google App Engine, Heroku. As the runtime and most of the common configuration is already taken care of, the organization just needs to take care of their applications, services, and their specific configurations. This makes life much easier on the development team's front. Pass options are available across all the development areas, various programming languages, databases, analytics, AI, middlewares, etc. There are continuous additions of more and more options in this area as they are becoming the preferred choice when it comes to cloud. Another related offering is ECS by AWS or GKE by Google Cloud. These options lie somewhere in the middle of IAS and PaaS. Teams can create and manage containers in case of ECS, whereas GKE provides options to manage the Kubernetes platform. The last offering of the cloud is called SaaS, Software as a Service. In this case, the hosted software is provided for consumption. Typical examples of this could be Salesforce, PayPal, Google Apps, Slack, etc. This option is not very relevant when it comes to microservices deployment. But the other two options, both IAS and PaaS, provide many options to scale our services and optimize the operating cost. On the negative side, it does create coupling in some cases, especially the PaaS solutions. Here are some popular cloud providers, AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, IBM Cloud, and Alibaba Cloud. As we already discussed, using containers is one of the most favored options to deploy microservices. In this section, we will take a closer look at some of the popular technologies and frameworks around it. This includes Docker and Kubernetes. There are many container technologies available in the market, but Docker is a clear winner. Let's see what it offers. Typically, when we use containers, we need a mechanism to create, manage, run, and monitor the containers. Docker provides the utilities and frameworks to achieve this. We define the containers in the form of images. The image can contain the build and run instructions. The instructions could be installing the Java runtime, getting the service artifact, starting the service, etc. If you see on the right side, that's the Docker registry. Docker maintains the registry to keep the container images, both private and public. When we create the image for our service, it might include the reference of a public or private image. For instance, the Java runtime image is already available in the public registry. Rather than you writing the instructions to download and install it, you can just inherit the instructions from it. 
Docker provides the command line interface to interact with its APIs. You can install the CLI at your build server, which can help in creating the service image for you. As discussed, this image is portable and can be used to run service in any environment. You can run the image with the help of Docker CLI again. But the real work is done by Docker Engine, which keeps running as a long running daemon process. The Docker Engine sits right on top of your host server, where we are trying to run our service. The engine is responsible for managing containers and it provides the APIs for respective operations. If we need to create multiple instances of the service, we can just execute the run command again. If we need to delete one of the service instances, we can do it with the API again. Docker provides an end-to-end -end platform to register, create, run, manage, and monitor the containers for us. Imagine the scenario where multiple services of our e-commerce system based on containers are deployed across multiple nodes. Each of the services have multiple instances. Let's say a few instances of the product catalog service are down and we need to replace them. All the instances of the return service are not getting utilized and we must retire them. With hundreds of services and multiple instances of each, this can become a time consuming and error prone task. We need automation to respond to such cases. Kubernetes provides the platform to automate multiple deployment activities, including container creation, container replacement, scale up or scale down containers, rollbacks, and storage orchestration. The primary component of Kubernetes is called cluster, which represents the collection of nodes and pods. Node refers to a machine, either physical or virtual, whereas pod refers to the containers residing in it. We can deploy all the microservices of our e-commerce system in one Kubernetes cluster. Each of the microservices can run in one or more pods. Let's look at the components which help Kubernetes to maintain the desired state. Each cluster has a control manager, which is the primary component that runs the controller processes. This includes the actions such as noticing and responding when nodes go down, creating access controls, ensuring pods replication, etc. Cluster also has a scheduler when a pod is created, it's the scheduler responsibility to select the node for it. Cluster has the API server, which is the front end for the Kubernetes. External as well as internal components can interact with the Kubernetes cluster through the API server. Cluster uses etcd, the open source tool, to manage the configurations around node, pods, access accounts, etc. Apart from the cluster level components, node level components also participate in the orchestration. Kubelet, this is the agent that runs on each node in the cluster. It ensures the containers are running in the pod. In Kubernetes, a concept referred to as service routes traffic across a set of pods. Kubeproxy is a network proxy that runs on each node in your cluster implementing the service concept. The Kubernetes architecture is complex, but that's how it manages the container orchestration across multiple nodes. Because of its reliability and open source, it's one of the favorites in the microservices community. Google developed and open sourced it. Due to its increased adoption, almost all the cloud providers have started offering this platform. As the name suggests, we will understand how to test microservices in this section. We will cover standard, post-production, and non-functional testing as part of it. Test Pyramid was suggested by Mike Kahn in his book on Agile Testing. This is an extended version which is more aligned with microservices. Sam Newman, one of the prominent advocates of microservices, mentioned this in his book. The pyramid says that most of the tests should be done during the unit testing stage. 
which targets to validate functions or methods in the code. Moving up in the pyramid, the next level of test should validate the APIs in microservices, which are more public facing in nature. The number of tests at this stage should be less than the number of tests in the unit testing stage. And the next level should ensure the end-to-end -end testing, which should focus on the user's use cases. The number of tests in this zone should be the lowest. The scope of the test increases as we go up in the pyramid chain, from the function to the end-to-end -end use case. On the other hand, the speed of these tests decreases as we move up in the chain. The pyramid structure provides us a speedy rollout of our releases. If we do it other way, we are going to lose a lot of time very late in the pipeline. End-to-end -end tests are much costlier in terms of time and resources to the service test. And the service tests are much costlier than the unit tests. Let's assume we have the order service. We can have multiple operations in the service, including create order, validate order request, calculate order total, create success response, create error response, etc. Functions like these are the focus area for our unit testing. We can validate the functions independently. If we have an external dependency like external services, databases, file system, etc., we can use the mock objects to replace them. The best part of the unit test is that they can run along with our build process. They are much faster to execute and can validate the function behavior much early in the pipeline. Service test should validate only the public facing APIs instead of all the functions as we did in the unit test. If we continue with our example, we do have the external facing APIs in our order service. For instance, the create order, update order, cancel order, etc. We can validate these APIs independently by accessing these APIs with an external tool. But the scope should only be one service at this stage. If the service is communicating with other services, we should stub out the dependent services. For instance, in our case, we can stub out the product catalog, inventory service, payment service, delivery service, etc. Service tests provide the key validation to boost the confidence of our services. These tests could be the next stage after the unit test in the build pipeline. As discussed earlier, end-to-end -end tests focus on the user journeys. The APIs in our service could be the entry point for the user journeys and it can touch multiple services during it. If we take the example of create order user journey, we would be communicating with services like product catalog, inventory service, user service, payment service, and delivery service. At this stage, no stubs but the real service instances are used. This is closest to how services will interact in the real time. This is the ideal validation but most difficult to carry out. In microservices world, it raises many questions. Who is going to own these tests? Which version of a service should be used? Is it the production version or the unreleased version, which could be unstable? What happens if the dependent service is down? And many other questions. This is the reason these tests should be least in the number. These tests are so difficult to carry out that many experts believe this number should ideally be zero. To speed up the releases, there are alternate strategies which organizations have started adopting. We will discuss two such strategies here. Blue-green deployments and canary releases. Both these strategies are carried out once the service update is released in production environment. In blue-green deployments, the new version will not cater any request immediately. 
Let's say our service version v1 is already serving the request and we are deploying a new version v2 in the production. Version v2 will not serve any request immediately, but the smoke test will be carried out on this version. If the smoke tests are passed, we can switch the real-time request to version v2. In case they have failed, we just bring down version v2 with no impact on the existing execution of request. Canary releasing is an alternative approach to the blue-green deployments. In this case, version v2 will start serving the request as soon as it is deployed. This can be done in parallel to the version v1. We can have v1 serving 50% and the v2 serving another 50%. These percentages can vary. We can monitor the service responses for each of these versions. If the version v2 responses are as per our expectations, we can switch to v2 completely. If we find issues which are not acceptable, we can always switch back to version v1 serving all the requests. Another important aspect in testing is to validate the non-functional concerns. For instance, performance, reliability, scalability, security, etc. To validate these concerns, again, we must follow the pyramid structure. We should try to validate these concerns at function and service level first before moving to the end-to-end -end test scenario. For some of these concerns like performance, reliability, organizations are also using monitoring as an alternative strategy. We will be discussing this topic in the next section. Monitoring is not a new concept. It helps in identifying the failures fast. System reliability depends on how soon we can detect the failures and can fix them. The more efficient our monitoring is, the more early we can detect the failures. In this section, we will understand how to monitor the microservices, the patterns and technologies to manage metrics, alerts, and logs. Life is much simpler with monolith systems. It has a single application deployed over a very few servers. We can easily monitor these servers and the application logs. Microservices architecture introduced multiple services each service having multiple instances, deployed over multiple servers, containers, pods, clusters, etc., and generating multiple sets of logs. Monitoring such a system needs different skills. In microservices, everything is distributed. Each of the microservices could be deployed over multiple VMs, containers, pods as we use in Kubernetes and platform as a service solutions over the cloud. We must monitor each of these, including the services, VMs, containers, pods, and pass platforms. The fundamental approach in this case is to monitor all the small things and aggregate to get the bigger picture. There are three important tools which help us in this task. Metrics, helps us in understanding the service or system behavior. Alerts, which notify us in case of failure goes beyond the limits. And logs, which help us in the detailed investigation. Let's dig a bit deeper in each of these aspects. Application metrics were not very prevalent earlier, but with microservices, service metrics has become a key aspect to monitor. This can directly provide the insights on the performance of specific services, and we can take prompt actions to replace the instances or roll back the latest spells. We can track multiple metrics for a service. Some of the primary metrics include latency, traffic, error rate, etc. Latency indicates the total response time of a request. An example of this metric could be to provide the average latency of the order create API. We can measure the traffic for this request. For instance, we can track the number of order requests per second, which can provide the insight on the service load. We can measure the error rate, which can tell the percentage of request failed compared to the total number of requests received by the service. 
Such metrics can provide an instant view over the service performance to the operation team or the other stakeholders. Based on these metrics, apart from current availability, we can also assess the future availability of our services. Similarly, we can also monitor our various host options, including VM, containers, pods, and PaaS platforms. We can track multiple performance metrics for the host, including CPU usage, where we can monitor the usage of the CPUs, memory usage, where we can assess the memory outage, if any. We can also check the uptime of these systems so that we know they are healthy and can serve the request. System metrics were the primary tools to assess the monolith systems. In case of microservices, complexity increased due to multiple host options. Also, the instances increased significantly, which can easily reach to hundreds or even thousands in some cases. Metrics provide the foundation to generate the alerts. For instance, if we see the latency of our order service it's going beyond two seconds, we know our customers are not going to be comfortable and we must act on it. Similarly, if the CPU usage of any host goes beyond 75%, we know there is a probable chance of outage and we must resolve it by increasing the capacity or taking other measures. We can send the alerts to the operation teams, SREs, etc. through multiple modes, including email, Slack, Microsoft Teams, PagerDuty, etc. The alerts help the teams to promptly act and avoid any outage. Or if the outage is already there, fix it as soon as possible. So what do we need to achieve this? We need highly scalable metric scraping mechanism, which can collect the metrics across multiple services and hosts. It should be able to support multiple platforms as the services will use different runtimes and technologies. We need a highly available and scalable storage solution where the records can be retained for longer periods. We need the query capabilities where the data can be sliced and diced across various parameters, including servers, host, APIs, regions, etc. We need a way to visualize where we can see the bigger picture along with the specific details. Some of the popular technologies in this area include Prometheus, which provides the end-to-end -end solution. It's developed by SoundCloud and is being open sourced. It got its popularity as it provided native monitoring for Kubernetes. This offers pull mode scrapping, which makes it highly scalable. Metrics capture, time series data, and influx data provides the most popular storage in this segment. Grafana was already there as a system monitoring tool. This primarily provides the visualization capabilities. Kibana is also a popular visualization tool which comes along with Elasticsearch. We will learn more about Elasticsearch in the next chapter. Alerts and metrics help in understanding the location of outage. But troubleshooting cannot be done over it. We need logs to investigate an issue in detail and provide the fix accordingly. Again, due to multiple sources and distributed system, we need different skills and log management as well. We need a mechanism to aggregate the logs across different services. We need a storage and a mechanism to search and query the logs based on multiple attributes. We need a mechanism to trace the user request end to end. In this chapter, we will go through two important patterns, log aggregation and distributed tracing. If the logs are aggregated to debug an issue, we do not need to span over multiple sources. We can just access the single host and get the required information. There are many technologies available to achieve it. One of the most popular frameworks is ELK Stack, where the E stands for Elasticsearch, a well-known search engine, L stands for Logstash, a logging utility, K stands for Kibana, a data visualization tool. The responsibility of Logstash is to collect the logs from all the individual services. The Logstash agents sit on the host machines and keep sending the logs to Elasticsearch. As already said, this is a search engine which has its own storage and API. 
the Elasticsearch API indexes all the available log entries and make them searchable. The Kibana provides the data visualization and exploration tool for viewing the logs and events with ease. You can aggregate, filter, and search the logs through this. You can also use it to develop the metrics and alerts. Though the ELK stack started as a log aggregator, but it's getting into full-fledged monitoring solution as well. It has started providing metrics and alerts feature for services as well as the systems. Another challenge with the logs is the tracing of the user request. A user request can span multiple services. We must have a correlation ID so that we can stitch together all the log entries for a specific user request. To achieve this, a correlation ID, also known as trace ID, is created when the service is first hit. If the service has to make call to another service, it can pass the correlation ID in the request. Services can use this correlation ID in the logs. Let's take an example to understand this. Let's say the user requested for the return of an order. The request to complete, it needs to go through multiple services. Order service to validate the order details. User credit service to update the user credits. Delivery service to send the item back to the warehouse. The return service will be responsible to create the correlation ID as soon as it gets the request. When it is calling other services like order service, delivery service, or the user credit service, it will pass the same correlation ID. If they need to call further, as in the case of delivery service calling the inventory service, the same correlation ID will be passed again. And all the services participating for the request will use the same correlation ID while capturing the logs and traces. In case of troubleshooting, any person looking into Kibana interface can filter the logs based on the correlation ID and can get the complete request path. He or she can clearly view where the problem took place, which service, which instance. Distributed tracing is one of the most useful pattern when it comes to logging in the microservices world. There are many utilities available which help in creating and managing the correlation ID in the request and logs. In Java world, one of the popular library which does it is Spring Cloud Sleuth. Similar libraries are also available in other programming languages. One important criteria we need to deal with is to standardize the logging format across all the services. Though the microservices provide the freedom to choose independently on multiple implementation aspects, but the logging aspect needs a wider governance and must be attended in a collective manner. Role of monitoring is no more limited to production systems only. Many organizations are using it as an important tool to advance their builds in the build pipeline. Service metrics help in providing good insights, including the service latency, error rate, etc. We can use these metrics to assess the health of our services in any environment, be it the integration, staging, performance of the production. We can use our test cases to generate the synthetic request and get the metric results. We can put lenient thresholds as we move up in the build pipeline. Putting monitoring across different environments has multiple benefits. It can provide an automated checkpoint for the builds. It can also help in building an operation mindset for the development teams. We must develop our services so that they are easy to debug and roll back. Monitoring across different environments help in building this mindset. So what did we learn? We learned to define the microservice boundaries with the help of core principles. We learned to manage data, transactions, and data synchronization needs for reporting. We learned the external and internal service interactions with the help of multiple patterns. We learned to deploy our services through continuous delivery, automation on multiple hosting options, including VM, cloud, containers, and Kubernetes. We learned to test our services with the pre- and post-production strategies. We learned to monitor our services and underlying host with the help of metrics, alerts, and logs. 
We covered most of the aspects around microservices architecture, except a few like security, scalability, etc. These are advanced topics and must be learned separately. Each of the patterns and technologies we discussed as part of the course are quite broad in nature. I tried to cover them from concept perspective. You can check them out from implementation perspective as needed. With the microservices architecture, we get many benefits. We get increased flexibility in terms of updating the technology and other dependencies for the service. We get the capability to independently deploy and test them. We get increased reusability of business functions through them and the overall maintainability of the service increases. But this adds many more variables in the system. We get more services to manage. We get more host to manage. We get more technologies to manage and we get to manage service interactions. All of this adds up to more complexity. These complexities need to be managed well. Here are some mantras which can help in resolving the complexity challenges. First mantra is to decentralize. Organizations as well as individuals need to come out of the mindset to centrally control or govern the evolution of services. Most of the things should be independent and the complete autonomy should stay with the service team. There could be some cross-cutting concerns like logging, monitoring, etc. For cases like this, instead of centralized governance, we should have shared governance where each team can put their thoughts forward and decide over a common strategy. We should not have a central controller which is orchestrating the request. Instead, we should go with the choreography. We should not have dependency on the middleware. Instead, we should build the smart endpoints and dump pipes. Automate is the best strategy to deal with so many variables. We can apply the automation in multiple areas including testing, deployment, monitoring, rollbacks, etc. We should plan for the failures, whether it's related to network, host, or the service itself. We should develop the services, keeping the fallbacks in place. We should increase our observability of the overall system. We should monitor each and every small thing present in the system, service, host, container, etc., and aggregate them to get meaningful metrics and alerts. This directly impacts the overall availability of our system. Here are some good references if you're interested in exploring the topic more. When it comes to books, the first book come to my mind is Building Microservices. It's written by Sam Newman. It provides the end-to-end -end perspective on this topic. Microservices Patterns. It's written by Chris Richardson, which talks on this topic from the patterns perspective. Designing Data Intensive Applications by Martin Klepman provides the insight from data perspective. On the web, as I already mentioned, Chris Richardson's site www.microservice.io provides a good starting point. Most of the cloud providers have a good literature on this topic, including Google, AWS, and Azure. You can visit either of these sites to refer the topic in detail.